This being Palm Sunday, uh, the first day of what we sometimes call Holy Week, the Sunday on which we remember Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, deliberately setting off a course of events that would lead directly to his own death less than a week later. I say this being Palm Sunday, we often break from the current series of sermons to uh, take on a different part of Scripture, and so we'll step back in time today, some 700 years from the incarnate life of our Savior on earth, to the prophecy of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah chapter 52, to be exact. This is at page 613 in your pew Bible, not as uh, is the page number supplied in your bulletin, but rather page 613. Isaiah chapter 52, we'll pick up at verse 13 after we pray. Father, we come to what must be uh, a certain peak in all of Scripture here in the 52nd and 53rd of Isaiah, certainly holy ground. So, Father, we pray that you will grant to us the grace to receive these things uh, for what they are, the glorious gospel, in fact, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed. For our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence. There was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, 
shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Behold, my servant will act wisely. Yes, he shall be high and lifted up. Ah, yes. We can picture that in our mind's eye, can't we? Wise, yes, raised up. Of course, this is the Lord. The Lord, highly exalted. Of course, what else? This is the servant of God. This is the Savior. This is the victor. This is the deliverer, the Messiah. He has come to save. He has come to reign. But what is this, Isaiah? They will be appalled at him? Disfigured he is beyond that of any man, his form marred beyond human likeness? What can you mean, Isaiah? What can you possibly be saying? Even the scribes had to scratch their heads 700 years before the coming of Christ when Isaiah penned and they read these words by the inscription of the Holy Spirit. Yes, even Jesus' own disciples, as we've seen again and again in Matthew's gospel in recent weeks, couldn't even understand, not even just a few days before these things actually came to pass. They didn't get it. They couldn't understand it. They couldn't grasp it. As Jesus clip-clopped his way into Jerusalem that Sunday morning, a, don a donkey and the crowds cheered the coming of the king, their deliverer, strewing their clo clothes along his path, waving the Palestinian flag, palm branches in the air. Verse 13 might, might well have been on their minds, right? The servant king acting wisely, raised and lifted up and highly exalted. But nobody... Nobody was thinking about verse 14. About the delivered, disfigured, beaten. Beaten beyond recognition. Disfigured. Beyond human appearance, stricken by God, smitten, afflicted. Nobody, that is, except for the servant himself. Who knew full well from the Scripture exactly where these events were leading. Shock and dismay would overcome the disciples before the week was out. As doom and humiliation and ignominy took the place of praise and adoration and exaltation for this servant. And by Friday, his appearance would be so appalling that far from thinking him the servant of the Lord... They will wonder if he's even a man. This servant, of course, is a man. Jesus Christ was, still is today, even in heaven, a man, a fully man, genuinely man, as in every way we, you and I, are saved for sin, though obviously he's glorified now. So all of this suffering he underwent, he underwent exactly the way you or I would have undergone it. Exactly the same way as a 100% human being would. At the very same time, he's also God. 100% God. He is, the God. he is God the Son, and so he's both identified with the Lord and distinguished from him, as the same prophet pointed out to us, Isaiah, just a short time ago at Christmas time, the child who was born, yes, genuine child, but whose name shall be called Mighty God. He is the infinite God-man, and only as the God-man is he qualified to do the work of salvation. The writer of Hebrews tells us to consider him, 
to consider him who endured from, such, from sinners such hostility against himself. So that's exactly what we're going to do this morning. Consider him. First, consider with me the servanthood of the God-man, of our Savior, Jesus. Behold, my servant, says the Father, verse 13, my righteous servant, in verse 11. But how is he a servant? Well, in two ways. He's a servant in the sense that he's under the assignment, under the command of another. By his own willing submission to the Father, he obligated himself to the fulfillment of the particular mission that the Father had given him to do and to accomplish. He says in prayer to his Father in John 17, you remember this, I have finished the work that you gave me to do. His very death here described in bloody terms by Isaiah was part of that work. John 10, the reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. This command I received from my Father. So truly, he is a servant. He's a servant of his Father, doing the will of his Father in heaven. But maybe we might say even more than that. Because he was under the assignment, more, more than because he was under the assignment of his Father, Jesus was a servant because he became a man, because he was a man. And for God the Son to be a man, there had truly to be a lowering of himself. Who of us can tell how far that humiliation went? That is what a servant is, right? He's someone who is underneath, he's below someone else. And that is what Jesus placed himself, isn't it? He made himself... Would you please try to wrap your minds around this with me a moment? God the Son made himself your servant. God the Son made himself your servant. Your slave is even a proper translation. This is amazing. Amazing love, isn't it? This is God, God the Son, who has from all eternity past dwelt in the glories of heaven with His Father, in perfect communion with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. All things were made through Him. This is the servant of God. And now becomes the servant of man. By His own declaration, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. And as a servant, as a true and genuine human servant, He was therefore unable, here's another thing to try to, to grasp, as a genuine human servant, He was unable to fulfill the task that He'd been given. He was unable to, in himself alone to fulfill the task that he has come, that he had come to do. He required the strength of someone else. He required the strength of the Father. By the Father and the Spirit, the Scripture teaches us, led him, filled him, carried him. He was upheld by his Father. That we learn in another part of Isaiah, chapter 42. But that upholding didn't make it easier for the servant. In fact, just the opposite. It only made it harder. As a genuine, real human being, a real man, Jesus could never have undergone the suffering, the agony, the sacrifice as your sins and mine required of him were it not for the fact that the Father held him up, upheld him. Him. But being upheld by his father's powerful arms only meant that he was able to, then to go through and bear the weight of such agony and such sorrow as would have early driven any other man early to seek escape. As a genuine man, Jesus might well have sought an escape from the flood and the horror, but upheld by his father... He was able and had to suffer and bear it all, every ounce of the shame and of the agony and of the pain and of the ignominy under the wrath of God. It would have destroyed any other man before the task could be accomplished. 
It was as if he was being held up, observes one theologian, being held upright by strong arms, not allowed to fall while others beat him slowly to death. Consider with me second his suffering then. As the servant of his father, upheld by his father, he underwent the sufferings, sufferings the likes of which have never been nor ever will be again known to any human being. Having already taken the downward step to become one of us, he was willing to go even lower than that step by step by step until he should come to the very place of Golgotha, of the cross of Calvary, and then even lower from there, as at the cross he reached the bottom, the very depths of that abyss of hell. The wrath of God, full strength. They hid their faces from him that day. So terrible was the very sight. So grotesque. Marred beyond human recognition. A couple of decades ago, as I stood on the streets of Odessa, Ukraine, I had uh, one woman recount to me her uh, the story of the invasion of Odessa by the Germans during the Second World War. Her face was pained with the memory of thousands of Odessans rounded up by the Germans and jammed into a warehouse in Odessa, which was then set on fire and made the blazing grave of that mass of people. John Keegan, the British military historian, records accounts of Barbarossa, the uh, German invasion of, U of, uh, of Russia that began in uh, June of 1941, in which the Russian armies were battered and were swept up in great encirclements and then forced to surrender by the hundreds of thousands at the time. At a time, the city of Kiev had in it 665,000 Russian soldiers, five armies, 50 divisions, and all 665,000 were captured. That's the largest mass ever taken in an operation of war before or since. German eyewitnesses recollect the spectacle of the untold thousands of captives being marched pitilessly across the steppe, across the vast Russian plain to the prisoner cages where so many of them would freeze or starve to death in the coming winter. We suddenly saw a broad, earth-brown crocodile slowly shuffling down the road toward us. From it came a subdued hum like that from a beehive. Prisoners of war, Russians, six deep. We made haste out of the way of the foul cloud which surrounded them. Then what we saw transfixed us where we stood and we forgot our nausea. Were these really human beings, these gray-brown figures, these shadows lurching toward us, stumbling and staggering, moving shapes at their last gasp, creatures which only some last flicker of will to live enabled in order to obey the order to march? Were these really human beings? That was the thought, and that's the thought behind verse 14. His form marred beyond human likeness. My brothers and sisters, look upon him, if you dare. And even if you are able to look on him without immediately turning away in horror, look upon him on the cross disfigured beyond human recognition, despised, rejected, stricken, smitten, afflicted, pierced, and crushed, the blood running down his agonized limbs as the creator of mankind 
hangs, exposed in creaturely naked shame. Here nailed to the cross is the Lord of glory, stripped of every shred of human dignity as they cast lots for his very last piece of clothing. From his exalted throne in heaven to the bitter ignominy of the cross, personal devastation and ruin. We aren't prepared, are we? We're not prepared to accept the fact that this is, and nothing less than this, is what was required to secure our salvation. To satisfy the wrath of God against every one of us that we might be forgiven. But it was. This is what the servant had to suffer to save you. The servant had to suffer in order that he might become third, our substitute. He took our place. He took your place. That's the sum and substance of our salvation. Substitution. Who should have been nailed there? Who should have been beaten beyond human recognition? Who deserves to be nailed to the cross under the curse of God's law and wrath? Who is it? You tell me. You know who it is. It's you. It's me. Look on him taking the punishment, the penalty that we deserve. Why? So that we might have peace with God. He takes the punishment so that we might have peace. He suffers the violence so that we might have reconciled peace with God. The scripture makes this point in a myriad of ways, this substitution. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John says at the very beginning the of our Lord's ministry, or the Son of Man came to give His life as a ransom for many, as our Savior Himself said, or, or Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, or He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree. You know, the entire sacrificial system you've been reading about if you're making your way through the Bible in a year, that whole system of Scripture points to substitution, doesn't it? To the sheep, to the lamb, taking the lamb slain in the place of sinners, taking our sin with him. Watch the pronouns. Just, just look at the pronouns in Isaiah, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us. Christ for us, Christ in our place, the servant for the servant, suffering precisely so that we might escape the sentence by satisfying forever divine justice for you and for me and for all of the sheep for whom the good shepherd laid down his life. You say it in your hearts with me. In my place, condemned, he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior.